On the front page today, we'll discuss the pros and cons of moving the March 15 income tax deadline to a later date. In its contribution debate, in the contribution rather, of the 2024 25 budget debate last month, opposition leader Mark Golding called on the government to move the deadline, the March 15 deadline, to an April deadline. The current March 15th deadline for filing income taxes and other returns is pretty rough on everyone who has to file their taxes. Getting the past year's accounts audited and then preparing the tax returns all by the 15th March is really too much of a crunch. An April deadline would ease pressure significantly and it's time for change. Many other countries have later deadlines and it helps with their budgeting and their financial planning. So why not take a leaf out of their book? It would give taxpayers who file more time to get their taxes right and would improve the accuracy of their tax filings. It also improves compliance by allowing a more reasonable deadline. It would be a step towards a stronger and more stable economy. Mr. Speaker, the Minister was on board with this idea back in 21-2022, but we're now in 2024-25 and he has become very silent about it since then. I think it's high time that we see some action on this, Minister, and I hope that you will see your way to doing it. And of course, this was something that the finance minister mentioned from the budget debates of 2021. He had also posted on X at that time to say, subject to further consultations, to improve the effectiveness of fiscal operations, the government intended on making the bold but practical step of changing the annual income tax return and collection date from March 15 of each year to another time in April that would be decided on. So this morning, what are the advantages and the disadvantages of moving the annual income tax return filing from March 15 to sometime in the new fiscal year? We're being joined by tax expert Alison Peart and economist Jeremy Stephen. Alison, good morning to you. Morning, morning. Thank you so much for joining us here on Nationwide this morning. We are also trying to make contact with Mr. Stephen, who mm -hmm. is not yet on the line. First of all, Alison, who files income tax returns annually? One of the things I also want to clarify before we get into who. Yes. We keep talking about this annual deadline. There are different filing deadlines globally. And we tend to just use one. So, let, you know, let's be clear. We're talking income tax. Because mm -hmm. some people might be confused. There's filings each month for your GCT. There are other taxes that are due. But we're talking about income tax. In particular, income tax on corporations and income tax on individuals. And the tax filing for charities all due March 15th. So mm -hmm. your question about who pays it. If you're an incorporated entity, so a corporation, you must file and pay your income tax return by March 15th of the year following when your year-end closes. So I'll give you an example. Yes, please. If you're at December 31st, year-end 2023, March 15th. If you are a January 31st, 2023 year end for your corporation, March 15th of the following year in 2024. So to be clear, regardless of what your year end is as a corporation, once it ends in 2023, your filing deadline is so March 24. 15th, 2024. Okay. Uh Right. Alison, no. yes, want to understand something before you go further, though. Right. You said your year end. What determines uh, you when determine your year end? Your year end. Okay. So remember, there is a difference between individuals and corporations. Corporations are allowed to pick their year end. So if you go on the stock exchange, you'll see various year ends. March, you know, some banks are October. I, think, you know, I, I started my professional life in Canada, and their banks were mainly October 31. You will find charities that are incorporated, like Rotary, mandatory June 30 for the year. So you, you're allowed to have different year ends. If you're an individual, your year end is December 31. So if you're an individual, not every single individual has to file an income tax return. That was a change based on a reform that was done under Edisiaga. Mm -hmm. What happens is if you earn income 
other than KY. So, you know, you have a rental income, you have a little side business, you have to file and pay by March 15th. Also, if you are a professional, a budget some years ago introduced this, and we got into this whole thing as who's a professional. So if you're a doctor with a license, a, a registered public accountant, because some of us actually carry a license, if, you, if you're a lawyer, that's also registered. So there are requirements for these specific professionals. In, whether you are only KYE or not, you must file by March 15th. But generally, for everybody else, you don't file a March 15th tax return if you're an individual, assuming you only earn PAY. So because your employer takes off the money. You notice when you get your, 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 your P24 at the end of the year or every month when you get your pay stub? Income tax deducted. Correct, and sent off for you. Mm-hmm. Now, that is a little different than, say, the U.S. or Canada, where regardless of whether you're, P, whether you're, sorry, you're employed or not, you have to file. But we used to be like that, I understand. I pretend I'm young. You know, I wasn't here when we, everybody used to file. I came back in 2002. Yes. And it was only person that earned other income. Mm-hmm. Alison, so just to be clear. Yes. It's the corporations and the professionals and the people who are unincorporated, because some people run their businesses, you know, as a small trader, as an individual, they have to file March 15th. So March. it is a crunch. I can tell you as a tax person, it's madness. Because if you're a December year end and you have, most companies are, I'll give you an example. If you are a publicly listed company, you're not filing your audited financials until the end of March. So you're reporting to the tax authorities revenue before you're even reporting it publicly. Mm-hmm. So, I, again, I will admit I started my practicing life overseas. When I moved to Jamaica, I was in shock when I realized that we had one date. Canada, April 30 for individuals, June 15 for small traders or, you know, people who are um, self-employed or partners. And it's a rolling year. Rolling meaning six months after your year end. So if you're at December 31st year end for a corporation, June 30. Mm-hmm. Alison. I I want to hear more of that, but I want to take the break and come back. We're having a conversation about the pros and the cons of moving the March 15 income tax return deadline on the line at tax expert Alison Peart. And we also have now economist Jeremy Stephen. I'm going to talk to you some more, Alison, but just to bring in Jeremy Stephen to hear his initial thoughts on this idea that had been mentioned from about 2021 by the finance minister, also brought up again by the finance minister and the opposition leader in the recent budget debate what are your thoughts on shifting the deadline hey, good morning and thanks for having me good morning to everyone listening um well it's a positive thing it's better for government's cash flow management i believe and also better from the point of view of ensuring compliance but when i say it's better from the point of view of government having let's say more regular or insured payments and that benefits his cash flow. There's always a flip side to this that I can get even deeper into. To me, it's a small or relatively small issue given where Jamaica's public finances have grown to. But um, essentially, the critical issue that is the flip side I'm talking about is nothing more than government having the ability to make its, or its tax credits in a much earlier fashion. If you don't have a rolling um, schedule, let's say for argument's sake, as Alison was talking about earlier, Mm -hmm. but you're delaying those, um, that filing period, it means later in the year, the average Jamaican who may want to recover or depends on a tax credit being paid in, may very well have to wait just a bit longer for that tax credit. And that's really the only critical downside considering the composition of um, people in Jamaica. But given that the government has done better fiscally, it may not be as big a concern as it may seem as I'm bringing across. I see. Uh, Well, it seems as if 
both of you, Alison, Jeremy, are stringing yes. this positive line as it relates to these are the benefits. There, there would be some benefits as it relates to moving this deadline. But I want you to listen to what the finance minister said as it relates to why uh, they're not looking to do that at this point in time. Take a listen. So Jamaica would be much more secure if revenues associated with the end of the year came in, end of the financial year, of one financial year, uh, well, and of the revenues associated with the end of the, cal the previous calendar year comes in at the beginning of the next fiscal year. Having made that suggestion a few years ago, the Leader of the Opposition revisited it, and Madam Speaker, it is something that we are still interested in. The challenge with it is that in the first year that you make that move, it would have a significant impact on your revenues and you would run quite a deficit because you would take the month with the largest revenue inflows and move it into the next financial year. So this is something that we're in a better position to do when we have reached our goal in terms of our fiscal target goal and we can make that change which would make our fiscal trajectory more secure going forward. Alison, you've heard what the finance minister has said. I don't even need to try and repeat anything. You're in a better position so to do than I am. <laughs> what do you make of what the finance minister that's is saying? That's mainly the corporate. So one of the issues, and I mean, my, my fellow commentator sounds like he's from Barbados. In mm -hmm. Barbados, they split personal income tax from corporate. Mm -hmm. So it's separate. The minister Correct. is making a valid point in that he's saying, look, Jamaicans pay at the very last minute, which is what I was trying to clarify based on the comment. Very few people get a credit. It's not like the U.S. where people, you know, get this wait for their tax credit because Jamaica, we audit. TAJ doesn't just give you a refund. So if you delay or you change the year and the, the filing deadline, there is no credit quickly that you're getting because if you are in a, people manage their taxes carefully because if you overpay, the TAJ is very careful before they give it back to you. It's not quick. So what happens is... Most people don't pay their last big amount until March 15th. But what I'm saying is that's, that can be managed. And where I, I, where I disagree with the minister is he keeps thinking that, like Trinidad, we should have one filing deadline. And Trinidad's filing deadline is April 30th. Now, with the government here end of March 31st, my thing is you can do it by separating the personal income tax having that as a different date, and having the corporate on a different scale. And you don't have to all do it the first year. So his point is valid, that because we wait to pay our taxes at, at March 15th, because you don't want to make a mistake during the year and overpay, because, again, you're going to need an audit to get the money back. But if it's in the first year, if you even just separate the personal income tax, because that is time that is spent. Even the charities, where they're not getting any money, but you still have to do the computation. If you separate that and even move as a transition, perhaps publicly listed companies to March 31st, where they're filing the income tax on the same date that they're filing their public um, financials with the JSE, or, like I said, with Canada, every six months, or Barbados, they have it based on when your year ends. So it comes in evenly. So his point about the first year is valid, but that assumes you move everybody into one date. And all you're doing is shifting the stress on auditors and accountants by a month. I'm positing you separate the two, and then it makes life easier. And you can have a transition period. Mm-hmm. And, and that would cure the, 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 the issue as it relates to when the revenue comes in and the deficit that the government would exactly. have to... I see, I see. And then as an accountant, I'm saying to you, between January and March 15th, particularly the small firms, we are so stressed out that most, of, most people coming out of university look at us and don't want to even come into the profession. Mm. Which makes so tax compliance, compliance harder. Which makes tax compliance. Because think about it. If you have to prepare by March 15th, few audits are done. And you're going to really focus on your bigger clients that are paying you more. Mm -hmm. So 
So, you know what happens to the smaller So, it's a disincentivization to the small businessman. Right. I see. And you want audited financials because there is a requirement, there's a size test for an audit. So, it's better quality information if we're not all running around like raving lunatics trying to meet the March 15th deadline mm -hmm. and also but, trying to meet an audit deadline. But before I come to Jeremy, well, Alice, some would say, you know, but if you if you run beyond the deadline, then you just pay the penalty and, you know, call it a cost of business, eh? Well, the penalty can be hard. Our penalty, don't get me started on our penalty system because you could be paying 20%. Is that 20% for the year, which would be divided up based on how long it takes to pay? Is so? Not necessarily. Oh. So our penalty system is also kind of painful. And let's be frank, if you're paying enough tax, why should you be paying any penalties and interest? And you raise another issue about extension. The U.S. employs extension where you make the payment, but you have to do the filing. You can, do the, you can file an extension to do it later. The concern I have, let's be, again, fair. Some of us, when we pay our taxes and we want a refund, we're not always above board with some of the things. So TAJ really audits you and makes sure before you get back your money, it really is your money. So you don't want to overestimate. So my concern is that March 15 tightness. We want quality of info. We want the right amount. And we also would want TAJ to be able to do a proper audit and assessment when you submit it. Mm -hmm. I want to bring you back in, Jeremy. Uh, you heard from the finance minister as well. What do you make of the arguments that he's now positing in relation to shifting the deadline? Um, for me, it's just more fiscal accounting than anything else. Uh, the impacts, uh, as far as I'm concerned, were well uh, exposed by my fellow panelists. But um, essentially, as I said, for me, all right, let me speak from a perspective of Barbados since that's what I really, really, really know well. Um, it would make more sense to have the rolling dates on the corporate side and separation from the personal income tax side. The only real cost to it, and this has shown Barbados up more recently than not, is having a staff complement that can do several audits throughout the year based on year ends, as was said earlier that we have different year ends we have about four different year ends really depending sorry four different filing dates really and truly depending on when a year end comes in some of our year ends are march some are june july very few some are september some are december thereabouts so you've got several different filing periods but you break down say the large amount or the large ground swell at the end of the year, thereabouts or just after for auditing, that Jamaica would have still been experiencing and still obviously experiencing with any shifting of dates. Uh, you're able to dedicate resources, one would say more efficiently. But the problem again is having the right staff complement that can do those audits. So I don't know if the staff complement in Jamaica is large enough given the corporate size of Jamaica, along with the mix of um, having personal income taxes in there as well, yeah. to effectively do that. Um, no, they so do. The shift because remember, hmm? the number is there hmm. now with everything at March 31. So we compound Barbados, where you have it thrown right. and you have a, band, a bag of them, you know, depending on the, 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 the year. But imagine right. the, the stress on TAJ and the audits with that deadline that we have. Oh no, I, I heard I heard your I heard your mea culpa really <laughs> and, and, and how stressful it is for those first three months of the year. I could I could just imagine, but again, I mean for me, I've seen how here having that rolling period has been stressful, but our our problem is that we don't have enough staff. Gotcha. If I could say that rather freely. So the again, with me not knowing Jamaica as intimately as I would love to, I can't say uh, definitively, if and you're educating me here, mm -hmm. if there was enough staff and the role in the sense because there's enough one staff. One thing I will say about TAJ, they have the staff to do the audits. I see. Uh, but, but Jeremy, as it relates to, I see you saying that it's stressful throughout the year because the deadlines are staggered throughout the year. I mean, auditing to my mind is a stressful job. 
So it's better to, Correct. to uh, you know, have it staggered so that you take on the stretches and tranches as opposed to this heightened stress period and then a lull for no, the rest agree. of the year. Is that what I'm understanding? We agree. We agree. But remember, the, the, the variable that I just had no certainty on was whether KJ was staffed to do ah, that. I, I know from I our experience in Barbados, it has been stressful simply because we can't hold on to enough auditors ah, I <laughs> to see. get the job done. I see. You see, so I, I made that assumption based on not knowing if KJ had the right staff complement. Because if you do stagger throughout the year, yes, it eases you in theory because you have fewer companies per period to, mm -hmm. to audit. But if you don't have the staff and then you, you have the same problem, but it's stretched throughout the year as opposed to just a few months, if you yes. get... Oh, let me, let me clarify yes. one thing for you. I'll give you the final word, Alison. Yes. Right, so I'm saying just to clarify, the TAJ staff complement, everything is online and we don't audit the minute it's sent in. So the difference is right. they have, we have six years for them to audit you. So the staffing complement right. really, and, and where it also helps us, TAJ system, when we have the surge on March 14th and March 15th, their system sometimes can't hold that weight of everybody going in. Okay. So All right. from, a, from an IT system, it's also... Easier All right. on the system. Thank you so much, Alice Appeared, uh, Jeremy Stevens. Thank you so much, Economist and Auditor, respectively, for spending some time with us this morning. You're welcome. Right. Good, good. Well, we're turning our eyes to something. Well, we're turning our skin to something very important because many persons have been complaining that it's very hot and we're not much in the summer period as yet scientists at the national oceanic and atmospheric administration the noaa are predicting that 2024 will shatter heat records chief scientist at noo no rather aa dr sarah kapnik says there is 99 percent chance that 2024 will rank among the five warmest years ever recorded not so happy about that but we have with us dr sarah kapnik to explain to us what's happening good morning doc Dr. Kapnick. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us here Good on morning. Nationwide this morning. Could you tell us some more about what your research, what the information is indicating about 2024 and the heat? Yes. So 2023 was the hottest year on our 174-year record. Mm -hmm. And we are entering 2024 with El Nino peaking and global ocean temperatures also elevated and warm. So all of our analysis the past years puts us at 2024 similarly being a warm year. It may break records or it may just be in the top five, but no matter what, we have expectations it's going to be a warm year. Hmm. And, uh, and does it speak of the entire year or particular months um, for the rest of 2024 that will be really, really hot? Well, on a global scale, because the El Nino is peaking right now, it's reached its peak, um, the next couple of months are, are when the, the temperatures are still elevated. We have a potential that we will actually move by the end of this year into a La Nina state, which will cool off global temperatures. But right now we have a rough chance of it going to La Nina, or it could be into a neutral state. So depending on what happens, uh, global temperatures could remain elevated or they could actually start cooling off by the end of the year. So that's what gives us the uncertainty that uh, 2024 may be in the top five, but not the hottest year on record as okay, a result. not the hottest. Dr. Kapnick, though, I see you mentioned or you refer a lot to El Nino. What exactly is El Nino? Yes. El Nino is when the global temp uh, is when temperatures in the coastal Pacific um, equatorial Pacific along the coast of South America are elevated in temperatures. And so the, the warmth that's stored deep in the ocean comes out of the ocean into the atmosphere and then warms the entire globe. And El Nino is the opposite. Cooler temperatures in that region then actually leads to cooling effects. Um, and so you get an El Nino roughly every two to seven years. Um, and so this one was a large one. It was the first one in several, in several years. And so it led to this elevated temperatures. But that elevation of El Nino, that's kind of an extreme year on top of the background of year and year and year of global warming lead to increasing temperatures as a long-term trend. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about shattering heat records. You're saying it might, it, it might not or is not looking up to be the hottest year ever, but it's going to be in the top five. What kind of temperatures are we talking about? 
Um, so you can think about last year and a little bit cooler <laughs> compared. <laughs> um, so the the expectations of the global temperatures um, already they are coming down about 0.1 degrees off of the peak, um, and our seasonal forecasts are putting that um, cooling down another 0.2 degrees, but it's still significantly um, significantly warm around the year or around the world. So it's more of an average of the last couple of years. And Dr. Kapnick, how is how important is it for countries like Jamaica? to, you know, prepare for extreme conditions from excessive heat, having their, their, you know, forecasting tools up and ready, knowing how to interpret these forecasts and their geographic information systems being able to properly map heat hazard outlooks. Yeah, preparing for heat hazards is of really high importance. Because of this background of global warming, we have temperatures going hotter and hotter every year. And the heat waves that we're experiencing are getting hotter. They're being longer in duration. And so we need to prepare for heat waves we've never experienced before, and they're a lot hotter. And waves preparers have the early warnings to knowing when those are going to happen so we can um, make sure that people get into cooling centers, that they change their activities outside, either shifting their schedule um, or taking more breaks, more water, because critically you get heat stroke, heat sickness when you're outside for a long period in that those hot temperatures when you're exposed to them. And so the breaks allows you um, to not get sick from it. And so having preparedness plans about how we deal with heat, having the early warnings, do you know when it's coming? All of those are a critical way that we can manage people getting sick or people even dying from heat. Mm-hmm. Well, did you get uh, an opportunity while you were um conducting those training sessions to view the systems that we have here and how we could improve those? Yes, I had wonderful discussions with your ministers of health, um, with people from from your commerce and business and trade, um, and we all discussed all the different ways that heat affects um, people in Jamaica and affects your commerce and um, ways for thinking about how to distribute information as well as um, how to prepare for it and how to make sure that um, people are safe and that also commerce is safe and so that you um, can still have the economy running and everything working despite increasing heat. And um, I just had an amazing discussion discussions here um, on this issue, and there's a receptiveness and desire to uh, work towards these types of solutions for dealing with heat. Mm-hmm. And you know what I'm thinking about, Dr. Kapnick, in relation to our, our most vulnerable population, the elderly, um, you know, persons like our, our children, uh, you know, how either the, the homes that they're in, if they shall, should get additional training or so to treat with heat waves or when we have any sort of extreme heat conditions in the country. Um, yes, there'll be information that will come out of how to deal with it. And um, often, you know, schools can be a safe place if the schools have air conditioning because that's yes. also when the heat peaks. And so it's preparing to plan for those vulnerable groups and what they need to do during those time periods. Mm-hmm. So, so there is then, or it would be advised that where there are um, homes where elderly people are or schools where children are where the the air conditioning or the ventilation is not the best to take a look at that as well. Yes, so as a part of heat planning, there's vulnerability assessments of local populations that can take place and figuring out where those uh, people are vulnerable and creating plans for how to make sure that they are safe during the heat. And so it's a matter of uh, what is what does the community look like? Who, how do you get the word out? And then how do you make sure that those people are safe and get to places where they can't be? Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Kapnick, uh, I want to switch a bit from the heat there because I know with these intense uh, climate change pressures, we also get more intense hurricanes. I- anything on the horizon from your perspective as it relates to that? Um, so, scientifically, we have a lot of questions about the how the changes in numbers of storms or um, the intensities may change. The things that we 
are really clear on climate change with hurricanes that you get uh, more storm surges. We also have sea level rise um, bringing the waters up close to the shoreline. We also have more intense rainfall and in hurricanes, and there's emerging evidence that you can also have more rapid intensification events. So hurricanes can go from a Category 3 to Category 5 at a much faster pace over a uh, short period of time, which creates issues in the planning. Um, we right now are looking at the hurricane season and preparing um, in the United States and preparing all of our partners in the Caribbean. We will put out our forecast of expected hurricane numbers and uh, expected major storms that will form um, in the third week of May. Um, and so that forecast will come out then um, and be the official forecast on expectations. Right now, we're closely looking at ocean temperatures that have been elevated because those can be th they're the fuel for hurricanes to um, grow and to be strong. And so um, we're watching the situation closely, but the scale of the forecast really is in May. And so we are waiting for the official forecast for third week of May. Dr. Sarah Kapnick, who is the chief scientist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I know you're in the airport making your way, back, your way back home, but very grateful that you were able to join us on this important issue. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for all the work that everyone is doing and getting the word out on heat and health issues. Indeed.